Chapter 35 It seemed to Link that Summer arrived in the rest of Hyrule some time on his journey to Free Meadow. When he appeared in Kakarika Village, standing next to Spirit, he immediately noticed the humid heat of an impressive sun overhead. It wasn't anything as bad as Death Mountain, but it made his brow break out in sweat almost immediately, nonetheless. Below him, the village bustled as always. Farmers worked their fields, harvesting winter crops or tending to their spring-planted ones which he thought seemed to have grown considerably since he was there two weeks prior. As he made his way down from the shrine into the village proper, Sheikah began to call out to him, waving jovially and asking him how he was doing. He didn't know many of their names, yet they all knew him. Despite his normal misgivings about people knowing him, that fact didn't bother him as much in Kakarika village. He made his way toward Impa's large home, but hesitated when he saw someone that he didn't recognize. The man seemed simple enough, tall with a medium build, white cheek of hair pulled into a high topknot, and clothes that left one arm and shoulder exposed, revealing a floral tattoo on his left shoulder. He was older than Link, certainly, but like with many Shika, it was difficult to tell how much older due to their hair color and long lifespan. The man had his finger to his chin, looking down at an easel and canvas thoughtfully. He held in his other hand a narrow-tipped paintbrush. Beside him, a small table had been set up with a multitude of paints, of various colors and several other brushes. Normally, he likely wouldn't have paid the man a second thought, but with the Yiga threat in his recent memory, the man stood out. He was clearly studying Impa's home with a critical eye. Perhaps he was just creating a painting of the house, which was beautiful in its own right. But Link couldn't shake the nervous feeling and seeing the man gave him. He watched the man for a time, before approaching Dorian, who stood dutifully before the bridge that led up to Impa's home. Kato wasn't present, but Link thought he saw him tending his cuckoos on the way into town. The Sheikah guard didn't notice him until he was nearly upon them. He too seemed to be watching the painter with keen interest. Link, Dorian said, eyes widening. You're back so soon. I just came from Rito Village, Link said, patting the Sheikah slate at his waist. Would you see if someone could take Spirit up to the stable for me? I don't know if I'll be staying the night in the village yet. Rito Village? Did you not say you were going to Gerudo Desert? Link hesitated, silently cursing himself. He had almost forgotten about his duplicity when leaving town. My plans changed shortly after leaving the village. Ah, of course. Dorian said. He still looked confused, however. I take this to mean that you will be going to the desert next. Yes, but... Actually, if you wouldn't mind keeping that to yourself, I would appreciate it. I'm trying to keep the progress of my journey quiet for now. Dorian nodded. Yes, I understand. I'm sure you do not wish to always have to answer questions about it. Something like that, Link hesitated. Dorian was Impa's guard. Surely that meant he was trustworthy, right? Impa would not have placed him into her service without reason to trust him. He glanced back over his shoulder at the painter. Who is he? He looks back at Dorian to see his face darken slightly. His name is Pekango. He only arrived in the village a few days after you left. You don't trust him? Dorian nodded slowly. I do not trust many outsiders especially those whose histories I cannot confirm. Do you think he might be a Yiga spy? Dorian started at the word, looking sharply at him. You know of the Yiga? I have encountered them on my travels. The Sheikah still looked confused, so Link lowered his voice and continued. One of them tried to kill me on the way to Death Mountain, and a few more were waiting for me when I came back down the mountain. Dorian's face paled noticeably. He looked horrified. I... I didn't know. I hadn't heard that any of them found you. 
How could you have? I only told Impa and Paya. It's why I lied about my destination. I wanted to throw them off my trail. I see. Listen, keep this to yourself. I don't know what my next steps are going to be yet, but with any luck, if there are spies in Kakarika Village, they'll think I went to the desert and report I'll be on my way to see the Rito next. Dorian nodded slowly, though his face still remained almost as white as his hair. She could truly were disturbed by the mention of their splinter clan. Is Impa in? I need to let her know of my progress. Yes, she's inside. Please, go on up. Link started up the bridge, but Dorian called back after him a moment later. He turned around to find Dorian looking up at him. But you did it, didn't you? You freed another of the Divine Beasts. Yeah. There's only one left. Dorian's lips upturned into a satisfied smile. He nodded to Link and turned back, waving down a passing Chica to take Spirit to the stable. Hope, Link thought, as he continued up towards Zimba's home. Every divine beast I defeat brings hope. He gently rapped on the wood of the door frame before sliding the door open and peering inside. Impa? Paya? Link! Paya appeared a moment later in the doorway, looking slightly disheveled. Her cheeks were flushed. Please, come in. She opened the door wide and led him into the entry hall. All of the pillows had been stacked to the sides of the room, and Link noticed that some of the floor appeared to be damp. He glanced at Paya and saw that she held a wet towel in her hand. Cleaning again, huh? Link said. Paya held up the towel, looking slightly embarrassed. I really do more than just clean. You just... Always seem to come around when I am. Her cheeks flushed a deeper red, which stood out on her normally pale skin. Paya? Impa's voice called from one of the back rooms. Who's here? Whoever it is, tell them to come back later. I'm busy. It's Link, Grandmother. There was a moment of silence that was then filled with the sounds of Impa's walking staff tapping the wood floor. She emerged from behind one of the staircases a moment later, eyes shining with excitement. You did it, she said. I did it, Link said, returning to her smile. For a moment, Impa looked far younger than her years. She stood up straighter, and her grin grew even wider. For a brief moment, Link saw a memory of a much younger Sheikah woman with a wide-brimmed Sheikah hat resting on her back and tattoo on her forehead. The family resemblance between Paya and her younger grandmother was uncanny. Impa's eyes flicked to the still open door. Her smile faltered. Close the door, Paya. Paya did as told, sliding the door shut. She then turned, going to the stack of pillows and removing three. Leave those there. I'm not finished with my oatmeal yet, Impa smirked as Paya dutifully put the pillows back. She met Link's eyes and winked. Come on, you can tell me all about it while I eat. She led him back into her small kitchen, which, despite having been used recently, was as immaculately clean as the rest of the house. Paya followed quickly, her chores forgotten for the time being. Impa walked over to the small, knee-high table and settled herself down into a small pillow. She motioned for Link to sit across from her, which he did. Want anything? Impa asked, picking up her wooden spoon and taking a bite. Link shrugged but nodded. He had breakfast not long ago, but it would be good to eat something other than fish. Paya, why don't you get Link a bowl? As Paya set about preparing a bowl of oatmeal for Link, Impa fixed her stare back on him. Now, how are the Rito doing? I haven't been out that way for a hundred years, but the way that Bard talked about them, it sounded like not much has changed for them from before the Calamity. Link began to tell Impa of his experiences in Rito Village, the way they seemed to still be flourishing, despite the presence of Meadow and the food shortages, the Hylian logging community, and how they were doing now that the Divine Beast had been tamed. A minute later, Paya approached, placing a wooden bowl of steaming oatmeal down in front of Link. Would you like some sugar? 
It's pretty bland without it. Sure, thanks. Maya smiled at him and rose, looking to the shelf. She frowned after a moment, however, and turned back to the table, scanning the items atop it. A moment later, she gasped and to Link's surprise glared at Impa. Grandmother! What? Impa said, suddenly defensive. You added sugar to your oatmeal. You know you're not supposed to do that. You're the one who just said it's bland without it. To Link. Link can handle a little extra sugar in his diet. I'm sure, but you need to be more careful. You aren't as young as you used to be. Bah! Faya reached down, snatching up the small jar of sugar from the table, still shooting her grandmother a fierce glare. She spooned out some of it onto Link's oatmeal, and then turned back to the shelf. She set it on the highest shelf, standing on her toes to do so, well outside of Impa's reach. She walked back over and sat down next to Link, likely so she could keep glaring at Impa. Link grinned, and Impa shot him a dangerous look. You would best wipe that smile from your face, boy. It's just that... I don't think I've ever quite seen this side of you two before. Paya looked at him and her cheeks flushed again. But she still sat up straight. Not many people get to see all that I do to keep my grandmother healthy. I'm healthy enough, Impa said, scowling, before returning to her bowl of oatmeal. Honestly, girl. You make it out to be a terrible burden. It wouldn't be so terrible if you didn't keep sneaking sweets when I had my back turned. You told me to clean the audience room just to get me out of sight, didn't you? Impa looked at her with a sly smile. Aya sighed, shaking her head. He woke suddenly, looking around the dark room. Moonlight streamed in through the window in his room at the inn illuminating the sparse furniture in pale light. Nothing moved in the room, yet something felt off to him. His instincts screamed that he was in danger, under attack. He threw the blankets off of him and stood up, looking around. He found his sword where he left it, sitting in its scabbard against his headboard, within reach, even when lying in bed. He unsheathed it, holding it firm in his left hand, and went to the window looking outside. Nothing moved. The door to his room burst open, and he whirled, dropping into a defensive stance, ready to lunge or dodge as needed. Pia stood in the doorway, dressed in her nightgown with a cloak draped over her shoulders. Her hair was down and her face lacked the makeup that it normally bore. She looked at Link with terrified eyes. Link lowered his sword, stepping forward. Pia. What is it? It's grandmother, she said. Now that he was closer to her, he could see her trembling. She's been taken. Taken? By who? Biting her lips, she glanced down at a round object held in her hands. Link followed her gaze. In her hand was a white mask, emblazoned with the inverted eye of the Yiga clan. Link stared at the mask, his heart thudding loudly in his head. They finally made their move. It would seem. But why this one? Why Impa? He turned, snatching up his tunic and slipping it on over his head. What happened? They ignored you? No. One of them tried to take me as well. Link straightened and looked around, concerned that one of the Yiga might be ready to burst into the room, chasing her. But then he saw her expression. There was terror there, yes but a hardness that he hadn't seen before. He looked at her more carefully, taking in her appearance. Her nightgown was largely covered by the cloak over her shoulders, but now that he studied her appearance, he could see the dark stains. Are you hurt? Paya shook her head. Good. He turned back and put his legs into his trousers, pulling them up and cinching his belt over his tunic. He strapped the sword over his shoulder, and placed the ancient sword in his belt. He wouldn't be caught weaponless again against these warriors. Finally, he strapped his shield to his back, grateful for the comforting weight. After attaching the Sheikah slate to his waist, he looked back at Paya. Do you know where they went? She nodded and turned, hurrying out. He followed but hesitated when out in the common room. Earlier in the night, he saw Pakango in the common area and had caught a glimpse at the location of his room. 
He motioned for Paya to wait and walked to the door, reaching out hesitantly and slowly turning the doorknob. Unlocked. Link pushed the door open and peered into the dark room. His eyes fell on the empty bed. He turned away, expression hardening. Together, he and Paya hurried out of the inn. The village remained quiet. No alarms had been sounded. The strike on Impa's home had been surgical and silent. If Paya failed to fend off her attacker, then he wouldn't have even known of the attack. Then why kidnap them at all, he thought, as they crossed the open square. Why not just kill me in my sleep? They hadn't even barricaded this door last night. He felt safer in Kakariko Village than other places, and hadn't even thought of it after the pleasant evening with Impa and Paya. Where are the guards? he asked, when he saw that no guards were posted outside of the home. Dorian went after them when I came out. He said that he thought he saw movement up the hill towards the forest. Link nodded and paused by the entrance to the home. He glanced back towards Paya, hesitating. Paya, this is likely going to be a trap. You don't have to accompany, if you don't want. I'll get her back. She looked at Link and shook her head. I need to do my part too. He nodded towards their dark home. Then go get dressed. You won't be able to fight very well in that. Paya glanced towards the moonlit hill, hesitating, but then turned and hurried up the bridge and into her home. Link followed, eyes darting around for any movement. It was possible that the Yika could still be close by. Once inside, he saw the signs of the fight. Paya had already gone up to her room, but the body of the Yiga lay in the center of the audience chamber, face down in a pool of dark blood. Grimacing, Link bent down and turned the body over, looking into the lifeless eyes of an unfamiliar man. He still had the knife in his chest. Link didn't think the man was from the village. Not the spy, then. Paya emerged a minute later, moving down the stairs with surprising silence. He looked up and his eyes widened when he saw her. She wore a dark blue, tight-fitting clothing and covered her from the neck all the way down to her toes. The Sheikah eye was emblazoned on her chest, but even this was a darker color than typical. Her neck was protected by a thick scarf, and a mask covered her nose and mouth, leaving only her eyes visible. Her hair had been pulled back into a tighter bun than she normally wore, ensuring it wouldn't get in her way. She had a curved Sheikah Kodachi sheathed on her left hip, and he saw two thin daggers, one on her opposite hip and one under her left armpit. That is, Link said, feeling a little stunned at her appearance. This was not the Paya he had come to know through quiet conversations on the balcony. He cleared his throat. Are you ready? She nodded. They moved as quietly as they could. Paya, with her outfit carefully tailored for stealth, made little noise at all. Link did what he could do to emulate her posture but they also didn't have time to waste on perfecting his stealth. How did they get past the guard? He asked as they climbed the hill, whispering so only Paya could hear. I don't know, she said. They just appeared in our room in a puff of smoke. One grabbed Grandmother right away. She was in bed. The other one tried to grab me, but we fought and fell down the stairs. She didn't elaborate further, but Link could guess what happened after that. The fight in the audience chamber the knife. It never occurred to me that you would know how to fight. Grandmother made sure I was trained in Chica fighting techniques, but... Link saw her shudder in the darkness. Yes, she knew how to fight, how to kill, but that did not make one a killer. Not like him. You did great. When we find them, focus on getting Impa to safety. I'll handle the Yiga. Hopefully they won't care about Impa once I arrive, Link thought grimly. The Yega will spring on their trap, and the two of them can escape. He glanced down to the Sheikah slate on his hip, positioning his fingers over the icons. The screen gave no indication by touch which rune he was pressing, but he was able to judge fairly well where each rune was located without looking at it. It would be a last resort. He didn't want to start flinging explosives around with innocents nearby. They reached the glowing shrine, 
looking around hesitantly. The nearby forest seemed dark this night, save for a handful of fireflies visible in the shadows. Link glanced towards Paya, but she shook her head. Neither of them had any idea where the Yiga had gone from here, assuming they had even come up this way. There was no sign of Dorian either. While they found some tracks in the dirt on the way up, hoping to find clear tracks in the forest at night would be difficult, even for an experienced hunter. Stay behind me, Link said, and then set out into the forest. He didn't set out on the path that led into the heart of the forest, choosing instead to remain in the shadows, carefully watching his steps. No sticks on the ground, he thought, as they made their way between the trees. He looked at the ground, looking for any sign of broken branches or twigs, but nothing but lush grass, plants, and flowers covered the ground. He recalled noticing that the first time he'd visited this forest as well. Unfortunately, there was no mystical rabbit-like creature there tonight. The forest all around them was dark and surprisingly quiet. He could hear night insects chirping, but they seemed somehow muffled. After a few minutes, Link stopped and held up a hand. He heard nothing behind him, so he looked over his shoulder. She was there, though barely visible in her dark clothing. So quiet. She doesn't make a sound when she moves. She may not have been a warrior by nature, but she clearly took instruction seriously. He looked back around, squinting as he gazed around the dark forest. The canopy overhead had grown so thick that almost no moonlight shone down through it. Anyone could be out there watching, waiting. Suddenly, a firefly burst into life just beyond the tree in front of Link. Its green light seemed too bright in the darkness, illuminating the rough bark of the tree. It faded after a few seconds, leaving a glowing afterimage in his sight. For a time, there was darkness again, and then another firefly began to glow. And another. He slowly stepped forward, and as he did so, several more fireflies flickered to life. They seemed to form a line through the trees, as if they were leading them to a destination. He glanced backwards, towards Paya, and saw that her eyes were wide over her mask. This is insane, Link thought, as he followed the lines of fireflies. Yet he felt a strong pull in his heart to do so. It was as if the forest itself wanted to lead him deeper. The children called the forest magic, and I saw that creature here. They reached a place much deeper in the forest where the moonlight pierced the canopy shining down into a small clearing. Link hesitated at the border of trees, looking into the clearing with cautious eyes. He felt rather than heard Paya stop beside him. Suddenly, fireflies all around them burst into life. Dozens, no hundreds, of glowing green lights floated around them, in the trees, in the clearing, from within the brushes and on flowers. Slowly, Link stood up straighter, gazing around in awe as the forest was lit up around them. Paya lowered her mask, looking around with an expression of amazement. Link met her eyes and, despite the dire situation, smiled. She returned his smile, no hint of the normal anxiety she displayed around him in her expression. She was quite pretty. That's when Link heard the voices. The fireflies around them winked out all at once, plunging them back into darkness. Paya raised her mask back into place. Link placed the shield on his arm and unsheathed the sword as quietly as he could. Together, they creeped through the trees towards the source of the sound. Don't need to do this. I'm here. Let her go. They made their way a short distance to another clearing, this one before a narrow brook that bisected the forest. Nearby, a small wooden bridge made from thick tree branches strapped together crossed the water. Across the bridge lay a meadow lit by the full moon overhead. Dorian stood there, his curved Sheikah sword held in his right hand. Another figure stood in the center of the clearing. He was tall and broad-shouldered, his clothing the color of blood, and his stark white mask identified him as Yega, though he wore more armor than the first one Link had fought. He carried a wickedly long sword by his side, held in both hands. We warned you, Dorian. You knew 
What would happen if you tried to leave the organization? The tall Yiga said. Paya placed a hand on Link's shoulder, stepping up beside him. She leaned close, whispering in his ear. That's not the one that took Grandmother. Link nodded, studying the edges of the clearing. Where was the other one? Where was Impa? There. He could just see a short form huddled against one of the trees. It was difficult to make out, but he thought that it must have been Impa. No sign of the other Yiga, though. How many were there? I know full well the cost of leaving the organization, Thorian spat, adjusting his grip on his sword, and I'm here to pay it. Just let her go. Let the others be. The Yigath chuckled. You fool. Do you really think your life alone will satisfy the master? He held his sword out, inspecting its shining blade in the moonlight. No, much more blood than yours must flow tonight to repay us for your transgression. Only after you have watched your children perish will I allow you to die. I won't let you harm them. Dorian lowered himself into a warrior's stance. You'll never harm someone I care about again. Behind Dorian, stepping out silently from behind another tree, another Yiga member appeared. This one was a much smaller, lither build, much like Delia had been. He crouched low as he approached Dorian from behind. Link stiffened. This wasn't a trap for him. It was a trap for another member of their own clan. It was a trap for Dorian. Dorian, behind you! Link said, bursting out from behind the tree. Dorian whirled, attacking the smaller Yiga, who leapt back and disappeared in a flash of smoke and light. What? The taller Yiga said, looking at Link. Though his mask showed no expression, his posture revealed shock. You! Link ran across the bridge to stand next to Dorian, who looked at him in confusion. He didn't hear Paya run up behind him, and he hoped that she would be on her way to free Impa and get her to safety. He couldn't do anything to signal her now, however. He didn't dare let the Yiga know that she was there. You didn't tell us that this one had returned, the Yiga said, looking back to Dorian. Dorian turned his gaze away from Link, instead staring defiantly at the Yiga. How fortunate, then, that you led him into our trap anyway. The Calamity truly smiles down upon this night. Enough of this, Link thought. He lunged toward the tall Yiga, thrusting his sword for the taller man's heart. The Yiga stepped back, bringing his own sword to bear. Cover my back, Link said, thinking of the way the other Yiga had approached. Dorian said nothing but took a position behind Link, facing the opposite direction. Link and the Yiga began to dance. The Yiga had the advantage of reach. His sword was easily twice as long as Link's, but Link struck out in quick blows that the heavier sword had trouble keeping up with. The Yiga swung his sword wide, and Link stepped into this guard, deflecting the sword blow with his shield and thrusted his sword up towards his opponent's gut. Its tip tasted blood, but the Yiga managed to avoid the worst of the attack, jumping back. He swore in a language Link didn't understand, placing a hand over the shallow hole in his gut. And then, in a puff of smoke, he disappeared. Above you! Dorian cried. Link leaped forward as the Yiga reappeared, swinging his sword down in a chopping motion, separating him from Dorian. Dorian attempted to attack the tall Yiga, but the Yiga backhanded him with a gauntleted hand, sending him sprawling to the ground. The Yiga wrenched his sword's tip out from where it had embedded in the ground and thrust it at Link's heart. He deflected it and rushed forward, sweeping out with a foot and tripping the taller man, sending them sprawling onto the ground. In a clean motion, Link reversed his grip on his sword and plunged it down towards the son Diego's heart. Suddenly, a sickle caught Link's blade like a hook, pulling him off balance and sending the sword's tip onto the ground beside the Yiga. At the same time, he felt something grab the shield on his arm and wrench it free. He leaped back, putting some space between him and the now three Yiga. Two more had joined the fight, each wielding their curved sickles. One of them threw his shield into the tree line. The taller one rolled to his feet and held his sword out to the front, staring at Link. Dorian stepped up beside Link again, holding his sword in a defensive stance. 
The standoff continued for another moment, and then the two smaller Yiga began to flank to the sides, seeking to surround them. Link flexed his right arm, angry at himself for letting his shield be snatched away like that. It left him feeling exposed. If there was ever a time to have that added defense, it was when outnumbered by these crafty fighters. After considering his options, he pulled his ancient sword free of its place on his belt, and ignited it in his offhand. Its blue blade shone in the night, and the Yiga seemed to hesitate for just a moment. Then, they attacked. One of the Yiga leaped in with her sickle, aiming its tip for Link's throat. He knocked it aside with his blade, but the tall Yiga's blade followed a moment later. Link blocked this with the ancient sword, which crackled with energy when the blades met. It didn't cut through the long sword, but when the blades separated, he could see a deep cut in the blade, the edges of which glowed with red heat. The third Yiga attacked Dorian behind Link, but he couldn't spare a glance for the moment. The taller Yiga seemed stunned by what had happened to his sword, but the second Yiga attacked again, lashing out with the same grace that Delia had. She fought viciously, striking with blindingly fast strikes. Link was not defenseless this time, however. He caught her blade with his own and then stabbed forward with the ancient sword, but she slapped his wrist to the side, and then attempted to grab his left arm, but he twisted out of her grip. He kicked her back with his boot and dodged as the large Yiga's blade almost split his head in two. He tried to respond in turn, aiming a cut at the Yiga's arm that would have disarmed him, but the tall man moved with quickness that belied his highs. Before Link could follow up with another attack, the other Yiga was upon him again, her sickle passing by his arm close enough to cut the fabric on his tunic. He held his breath, focusing on the moment. Everything around him slowed. He looked into the white mask of the Yiga woman, who had overextended in her attempt to catch him off guard, and then he thrust his sword into her heart. In slow motion, her masked visage looked down at the sword piercing her chest. The sickle fell from her fingers. Her knees began to buckle. Everything began to move around him again, and Link wrenched his sword free, crashing it against the taller Yiga's blade in a spray of blood. The long sword snapped in the place his ancient sword had cut. The half that spun free left a cut in Link's arm as it passed before sinking tip-first into the ground. He went in for the kill, fueled by white-hot rage, blood thundering his ears. Never again, he thought as he attacked the Yiga in a flourish of cuts. You'll never harm those who I'm sworn to protect. The Yiga, clearly a blade master in his own right, parried him with his broken blade, but barely giving ground. Not Impa, Link swung, and the Yiga blocked. Not Paya. Link tried to stab the Yiga's arm with his ancient sword, but the Yiga leaped back and then lunged forward, swinging. Not Zelda. All around him, battle raged. Dorian fought the other Yiga, but he fared poorly, sporting several shallow cuts on his arms and chest. Paya fought as well, engaged in a battle against a fourth Yiga member, who wielded a pair of circular blades with spiked edges. The woman Link stabbed lay dying on the ground, blood soaking the grass underneath her. And, in his mind's eye, Link could see three other Yiga closing in on Princess Zelda, who ran for her life. The tall Yiga's broken sword swung towards Link's side, but he met it with his Zora sword, before stepping forward and ramming his ancient sword up into the Yiga's throat. He swept the crackling blade to the side and deactivated it, shoving it into his belt. He ran for Dorian. The Yiga that he fought noticed Link had leaped back, disappearing suddenly in a puff of smoke. He reappeared in the air several feet away, and hovered there just long enough to fling a set of throwing knives toward Link. One cut a deep gash along Link's right shoulder, and he grunted at the sharp flare of pain, but didn't stop moving. When the Yiga fell to the ground, he was there. The Yiga desperately tried to defend himself, hastily pulling out his sickle to block. But Link knocked it free with a powerful two-handed chop that broke the other man's wrist. The Yiga's life ended a split second later. Link! Impa's voice. Link whirled, and he saw the last Yiga score ahead on Paya's bicep, one of the spikes digging deep. Paya gasped and backed away dropping her kodachi while holding her bleeding arm. 
something awoke inside of Link. A primal rage, unlike anything else he had felt since waking, but one that he was keenly familiar with all the same. He raced forward, crossing the distance with more speed than seemed possible. As the Yiga prepared to strike Paya down, Link reached her, shoving her back. He caught the circular blade between two of its spikes with his sword and twisted, breaking the Yiga's grip. He was the only thing that stood between this foul being and those he would protect. Nothing would befall them while he was here. He struck. The Yiga tried to fend him off with his remaining blade, but such a weapon was not made for direct confrontation with a sword, especially not one wielded by Link. The assassin's life ended a split second later. Link shook as he turned, looking at those around him. Dorian, who looked at him with abstract horror. Impa, who watched him with a keen eye. Satisfied. Zelda, who looked upon him with utter shock from her place on the ground. No. It wasn't Zelda. It was Paya. So why... Memories flooded in. That damn princess. Link tried. He tried, damn it. Despite their differences, despite her animosity towards him, he kept his temper. He kept silent, refusing to say what he really thought of her attitude towards him. He had even been willing to forgive her brash words spoken in misdirected anger after she apologized for the incident by the Sheikah Shrine. He had hoped that things would change after that, and perhaps they had even begun to. She certainly seemed kinder after her apology for a few days on her way to Garuda Desert. But then she grew surly again, often sighing to herself when she looked at him. And of course, when they reached the desert, she tried to leave him behind once more. Succeeded, in fact, much to his dismay. Urbosa had attempted to help him reconnect with her in a number of ways, but her most recent ploy had backfired spectacularly. She had likely embarrassed Princess Zelda too much with her thunderous practical joke the night before, which led to this. A missing princess. Urbosa sent a team of Gerudo out on both horseback and sled to search the area around Gerudo Town. She herself went straight for the Divine Beast, thinking that the princess had, perhaps, decided to get some time to herself for further study. Link, horseless and without a clue, chose to check the bazaar, thinking she could have disguised herself. After all, a disguise could work to get into the city. Why couldn't it work to get out? Every cloaked figure could be her, and he surreptitiously tried to verify the identity of each one, which proved difficult. Out in the desert heat, cloaks could be as much of a lifesaver as they were in the frigid Haber Mountains. He glanced up towards the sun overhead. It was approaching midday and the temperature still climbed. The wind had picked up as well, blowing dust and grit against his face. What if she's caught out in a sandstorm? He thought, and inwardly grimaced. He should have just tried harder to talk to her last night. She asked him to speak, to tell her what he really thought of her, and he just stayed silent. She assumed that he hated her, which he thought as he leaned against a palm tree in the small oasis wasn't true. No, in fact, he actually found her presence to be quite pleasant, when she wasn't actively trying to make him miserable. Those times when she seemed to forget her dislike of him, when she'd start speaking about her research, and her hopes of what discoveries they might find and he didn't think she was ever more beautiful than she was with her sleeves rolled up, working on some kind of internal component of a divine beast, or digging in the dirt with Pura. Goddess, he thought. What am I even thinking? He was fond of his princess, despite her prickly edges. Though he didn't like her temper, not when it was directed at him anyway. And he was hurt by her seemingly irrational dislike of him though he'd long since realized that such feelings were very difficult for her to control. And then, of course, 
There was what Urbosa had told him the night before. She gets frustrated every time she looks up and sees you carrying that sword on your back. It makes her feel like a failure when it comes to her own destiny. It wasn't his fault that he'd drawn the Master Sword. He hadn't expected anything to even happen. It was an accident. But then, that was the real problem, wasn't it? She's put in more than enough time. Ever since she was a young girl, she's gone through rigorous daily routines to show her dedication. Link had seen them, every day at dawn and dusk, often before she even knew he was awake, or when she thought he had stepped away for a time. When she could, she would do it kneeling in a body of water, though he didn't fully understand why. She prayed every day for the blessing that seemed as though it would never come. To think that he'd once thought her impatient. She really is quite special. Urbosa had spoken of her with such fondness, such love. Watching the way she brushed the hair away from the dozing princess's face, Link saw a mother's love in her eyes and tone. A mother like the one the princess barely even remembered. And suddenly, Link understood. He understood everything. Why she acted the way she did. Why she grew so angry at him. And why... He had been so unable to find common ground with her. It wasn't all his fault, no. The princess still had quite the temper, and he felt that her anger was misplaced and irrational. But he hadn't helped things. He'd been silent when she wanted him to speak. He'd been aloof when she needed a friend. He'd crowded her when she needed space. He'd stood behind her when in fact, perhaps, he should have been standing beside her, why hadn't he seen it before? Urbosa claimed that he wasn't to blame for any of it. But was that really true? Had he not dogmatically pursued the qualities of a noble knight, even when it was clear that such behavior did nothing to help? Perhaps his father had been right about a knight's duty, especially in the presence of royalty. But did Princess Zelda attempt to act like royalty when out of the castle? Did she act like she wanted to be treated like royalty? in any place they'd been on their journeys together. He was a fool. And now... Screaming. He pushed himself off of the tree. A cloaked figure from within the bazaar suddenly ran out of it, towards the nearby sand dunes. As she ran, her hood blew back, revealing a familiar blonde braid. Princess Zelda ran as fast as she could in the loose sand. And she was pursued. One figure, at first... Cloaked, but his hood fell back as well, revealing another, tighter-fitting hood and white mask. And then he was joined by another, this one a woman. He saw her just briefly as she whirled, throwing her cloak to the ground. She donned a white mask and sprinted after the pair. And then to his horror, a third Yiga clan member joined the chase, coming from the other direction, seeking to cut off the princess's escape. You be sure to protect her with your life, Urbosa had said. He sprang into motion, dropping his cloak and unsheathing the Master Sword from his back. He had to move, to run harder than he'd ever run before. He had to protect her. Zelda's cloak fell from her shoulders, finally discarded to aid her flight. Yet it was too little. The Yega easily gained on her, wearing shoes better designed for sand. Link's own boots sank into the sand too easily, while he and Zelda kicked up clouds of sand with every step. The Yiga seemed to barely leave footprints. He would never catch them in time. He could never save her in time. He yelled, trying to get the Yiga's attention, trying to do anything to stop what he knew would befall his princess. Yet they were single-minded in their pursuit, spreading out, surrounding her. She came up short, hand to her breast, looking around in terror as she realized that her escape route was blocked by the third Yiga. She spun trying to find another way, but the Yiga from earlier closed the gap. She whirled only to stumble backwards and fall as her first pursuer shed his cloak, stepping forward and wielding a wicked sickle. The Yiga spun his sickle in his fingers casually, 
and then raised it up above his head, preparing to end her life. No! The Yiga's blade fell and the Master Sword rose. The sickle blade spun away through the air. Link swept his sword down again in a two-handed cleave, cutting deep into the assassin from collar to rib. As the Yiga fell, Link turned, breathing heavily and looked at the remaining two would-be killers with a primal rage that he'd never felt before. They would not have his princess. The two Yiga backed up a step, glancing at each other. Fear showed in their posture. They looked back at Link and took another step backwards. Suddenly, with a burst of flame and smoke, they both disappeared into thin air. Link stayed there for a time, his chest heaving, waiting for a counterattack, waiting for the assassins to make another move. They did not return, however, and he gradually became aware of a new sound. Sobbing. He turned the Master Sword over, driving it point first down into the sand, and knelt beside Princess Zelda, who had buried her face in her hands. Princess, he said, are you all right? Did they hurt you? She shook her head, though her body continued to shake with her cries. Hesitantly, Link reached out with an open palm, unsure of what he should do. What was appropriate? She decided that for him a second later, however. She looked up and saw his hand just inches from her shoulder, and then she met his eyes. In a rush of motion, she threw her arms around him, knocking him onto his backside, and clung to him, trembling with renewed sobs. Slowly, carefully, Link wrapped his arm around her shoulders and held her while she cried. No! Link cried, stumbling back from Impa and Paya. He shook violently, looking around with wide eyes at the dark forest. This wasn't right. This wasn't where he needed to be. Link, Paya said. But he didn't hear her. He whirled. He saw the bodies of the Yiga, the assassins that had tried to murder his princess. He stopped them, yet... Where was she? Where was Zelda? The castle. She's in the castle. He needed to protect her. He needed to save her. Link removed the Sheikah slate from his belt with trembling hands. The map. The map. Where was... there? Link? What are you doing? Impa's voice. He ignored it. Instead staring down at the blue icon that indicated the Sheikah shrine that he had activated just outside of Castle Town. He would protect his princess. Link pressed the icon, and his body broke apart into thousands of blue strands of light as he teleported away from the forest to Hyrule Castle.